Good afternoon, you all. Thank you for being here with us. Uh, we have here five very deserving um, Yas Prize semifinalists, and I'd love for them to kind of each just tell you what stands out about their program. So we'd love to start with you, sir, and tell us what you do and why you do it to help our young, our young men succeed in school. Yes, so my name is uh, Anthony Brock. I'm from Montgomery, Alabama. I am proud to say I was actually born an educator. I come from a long line of educators um, and rooted right in the middle of the civil rights movement in Montgomery, Alabama. My father's a minister, well, was a minister. My father was a, a principal as well. Mother's a teacher. So I was brought up to always give back to my community. So in Montgomery, Alabama, right now, we started in 2015, but in 2023, we're educating 210 amazing young men who just showed me that they're watching back home in Montgomery. So shout out to the fellas back in Montgomery. Awesome. Thank you. And I want to quickly say that you all were donated a church for your school, right? Absolutely. Right, from the Methodist uh, Church Fund. Yes. How did you all, how were you all able to obtain that, uh, that building? Yes, yeah, so in 2015, we were looking for a home. I had 30 young men at that time who were uh, eager and ready to come to the school. Their parents were ready, but we did not have a location. And so the Methodist Church in the state of Alabama, they allowed us to do a lease to purchase offer on the church that sits right across from Dexter Avenue and right down the street from where Rosa Parks got on the bus. So we're just blessed to be in that area. But now we have purchased the building and it's a huge space. So we have our sixth through eighth grade uh, young men in that building, but we also have another school, a high school that's right around the street. And you guys are transforming the lives of men, young men only, because that's an area that's needing special attention. Is that a right? Absolutely. Our okay. young men, not just in Montgomery, but our young men across America, uh, they're behind right now in so many different areas. Yes. And uh, we've created an environment where they are um, celebrated, not just tolerated. They're amazing young people, and we have a staff that really believes in them. We tell them we love them all the time, but we don't just tell them, we show them as well. So that's very important. I love that. Thank you. Uh, Cornell. You're with the Brothers Liberating Our Communities. Tell us a little bit ho about how you all are ensuring that more young men are successful. What does your program offer? Hi, everybody. My name is Cornell Ellis. As she said, I'm the founder and executive director of Block Brothers Liberating Our Communities. We work to ensure that every student in America has access to a black male educator. Yeah, every student in America should have access to a black male educator. Less than 2% of educators in America are black men. and one black teacher in the life of a black student increased their chance of graduating from high school by over 30%. Mm -hmm. So when we talk about increasing, sustaining, and retaining black male educators in schools, we know that we're creating a self-sustaining system, a diverse pipeline of educators. With more black male educators, we have higher achievement, higher and more positive experiences for young black boys, which means that they're more likely to return to education as teachers. We are creating a cycle that makes us instead of the cycles that we're used to that break us. So at Block, uh, we believe that creating that self-sustaining ecosystem, uh, starting with the black male educators, is, is where, we, where we think the, the work really starts. So Cornell, one thing I want to note just quickly is that you all actually use Nas's album which is a hip hop album to connect with male educators. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a way of saying that we get where you are, we get where you're from, we're on your level. Tell us about using that album to help the teachers kind of connect to your program. Yeah, absolutely. So Tony Simmons is in the house, the hip hop educator. He's uh, will be uh, remiss not to mention him and his work and thinking about the way that hip hop relates to students. The same thing goes into place for our black male educators. And oftentimes when we look at albums like The King's Disease, which is reference to older kings and getting older and having to adjust and change and evolve. As if you, if you know, Nas is from New York City. He's been a rapper for over 40 years, right? Can't just rap about the same things he was rapping about when he was 20. And so the <laughs> album, his 17th album that just came out was almost a pinnacle of what it means to be an older, experienced black male in the community. So we use several tracks from that list several tracks from Kendrick Lamar's album to create thematic similarities from the challenges that our black male educators have in schools mm -hmm. to the challenges that we're seeing in the themes in the songs. Uh, and it truly does create professional development that's more relevant wow. in the same way that we see relevant curriculum and re relevant pedagogy. In the same way we're talking about individualized work for students, we should also have individualized learning for teachers. I like that. And when teachers are able to get development that truly pours into them and sustains them and keeps them in the work. So I love it. So the pedagogy that you all use to develop leadership with your teachers, 
is hip hop based and they can connect to that more. It's more relevant to what they experience. I love that. Thank you. Next, Hans, I'd love to talk to you because I know that in your LinkedIn profile, it says you want to be an ancestor mm -hmm. worth remembering. How are you doing that in your community for young black men? And, and for any, actually, any young men, not specifically. How are you doing that, your program? Yeah, thank you for the question. Um, I'm from Harlem, right? If anybody was expecting a Mississippi accent, speak to my colleagues back there, Kamora and Alicia. <laughs> um, but I'm from Harlem, spent over half a century in Harlem, and I'm down in, in, in the Mississippi Delta right now. And, you know, the Mississippi Delta is defined by slavery, sharecropping, a 1927 flood, and the notorious parchment prison, at least where we are. The towns in the Delta are dying. Mm -hmm. When you talk to young men, when I was up in New York and I had a, started a couple of schools, one of the words that was used, one of the terms that was used, we're going to work with our, quote, scholars. I, I, was, I was put on notice by one of my students in, in my high school. He says, why are you calling me a scholar? I don't want to be a scholar. He says, that's for you. And I had to listen and I had to take that back. And what I realized down where I am now in the Mississippi Delta, having been down there a year, that, and it's a, a problem throughout the United States. While the work of, of the head is rewarded and is part of the merit, meritocracy, the work of the heart and the hands is, is denigrated and put down and not recognized. And so one of the things, some of the things that we're trying to do is bring back the African American quilting tradition down there and, and we're creating a network of micro schools where creating those quilts, and I started to learn to quilt myself, I'm not great, but I'm getting there, <laughs> um, is gonna be part of the curriculum for boys and girls. I like that. We're also, the, the town where I am is part of, is known as the birthplace of the blues. We, we have people who teach that music to the young people in, in that community. Um, we're on the civil rights trail. This, the, the town where I am is the place where Emmett Till's body was prepared for transport back to Chicago. I live in the adjoining county where Fannie Lou Hamer was raised, right? I'm living history every day there. These kids have forgotten it, or they've been told it's not important. One of the first things I did, and, and, and Alicia was with me on that, is we, we took the kids on, on the Mississippi River canoeing. Yes. And my son, who's, a, who's graduating from University of Virginia, he says, he says, can I tell you something? He says, you don't take black kids on the Mississippi River. Nothing good's gonna come from it. <laughs> he, but the funny thing was, I had three people in Tutwiler tell me the same thing, and they wouldn't let their kids go. But for the 15 families that did, it was transformational. Yes. Because that river, it, 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 it speaks of, of freedom, it speaks of travail, it speaks of enslavement. Yes. And these kids have no clue exactly. about the lessons and the histories and the power, right? Right. I was, growing up, I was really big on what Nassim Talib calls anti-fragility, right? So, so that you either you break on, on, on contact with, with stress or you, you, you bounce back, but I want something better for the kids down there. I want them to come back tougher and better than ever based on that history down there. It's a forgotten area, not just Tutwiler, but the entire Mississippi Delta, and through combining those traditions, as well as things like robotics, responsible agriculture, mm -hmm. community gardens, um, uh, and, and, and drone piloting, uh, we're gonna combine those kids and, and, and combine those things for those kids and finally give them a sense of, of self-determination and agency that is not present in that community for any of the residents down there. I like what you're saying because what you're saying is that you're gonna ensure those students are connected to their heritage, their local heritage, the heritage of their, their race, their color, and the things that have happened in your town hundreds of years ago, 50 years ago, and that's gonna create a more uh, present adult and someone that is really engaged in their community, I think, that connection to history is so important. And I love the idea of the boys quilting as well, because we sometimes teach men it's not okay to do those things, but that creates a well-rounded individual adult. So I love that. And, and when you can get paid $800 for a queen size quilt, um, oh. that's why I'm learning. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so economic stability, yes, I love it. Sir, we'd like to move to you next, um, Anthony. Keith. Sorry, Keith, I'm so sorry. We look alike. He looks, yes. he looks fantastic, yes. so it's sorry. okay to, to be called Anthony. And you're with the National Fellowship of Black and Latino Educators. Yes, ma'am. Tell us what you do. I love it. Uh, we work to identify, increase, retain, and sustain the number of black and Latino male educators. Uh, we do that by uh, getting kids interested in high school and the education profession. Um, so often they think education is not a profession for them. They want to go in and make more money. And uh, my brother um, uh, Carnell talks about there's not, maybe not a lot of money in teaching, but there's a, a boatload of money in education. Um, and so again, kids interested in high school, uh, then getting them um, uh, supporting in teaching programs in college, getting them into the teaching profession, 
and then accelerating them through the, uh, to the C-suite. So often, we stop just at the, uh, the teaching world, mm -hmm. uh, but if we really want to make this a sustainable profession, we got to show them the end game, and that's what we do. And I think you mentioned that you're focused on the leadership aspect yeah. of education, so more black principals, more black superintendents, um, and ensuring that students say, if I see you in the building, I can relate to that more and Absolutely. that connects. And you also talked about emotional intelligence being a component of your program. I think that is so, that's brilliant because we're lacking that. Our young men are lacking that emotional intelligence. Tell us what that is and what that's doing for young men. Yeah, I think two things. On the first point around, um, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs says that you have physical safety and psychological safety. Everybody in this room has some affinity group that they need. And so what we work with our, our guys and our kids on is the idea that, um, you know, representation matters for kids and it also matters for adults. Yeah. On our emotional intelligence, we all focus on uh, social emotional learning with our kids, SEL. And so we see emotional intelligence as SEL for adults. Uh, there's nothing worse, you know, there's kids who throw tantrum tantrums and those things, but it's like, that's appropriate. There's nothing worse than an adult throwing a temper tantrum um, in passive aggressive ways and not saying things. So we work um, on our guys developing their self-awareness, their self-management, social awareness and relationship management uh, skills grounded in their identity. I like that, that's really great. Thank you so much. Um, last, we'll move on to Kyle, who is the founder of Detroit Achievement Academy. And I love your story because you talked about how you had some resistance with the building you needed from the public school. And I'd love for you to just quickly tell us about that and what you all do. Yeah, so um, I'm the founder and executive director of Detroit Achievement Academy and Detroit Prep, two free public charter schools in Detroit, Michigan. Um, yeah, when we were seeking to um, purchase a permanent school building for Detroit Prep, um, we bought it. It was it had been abandoned for 10 years. Um, the neighborhood reported all sorts of just horrible crime. They reported their just personal lives changing because the this 50,000 square foot building was empty. Um, we tried to buy it. There was a deed restriction on it, um, as you mentioned. So I went to the public schools as like, you know, the founder of a 40 kid school and said, oh my gosh, you know, um, actually there's a law on the books that says that you can't prohibit schools from using this as a school building. Um, could you remove it? And they said, no. And I said, oh my gosh, um, but it's against the law. I'll sue you. And they said, sue us then. Uh, and I was like, okay. So we filed suit and they told us in meetings, you know, we, we have $70 million in the bank. We can afford to wait, can you? And in my head, I was like, no. And, but out loud, I was like, yeah. And so immediately, um, you know, went to Lansing and said, didn't you mean to prohibit just this sort of bullying behavior? And Lansing said, yeah. And so then I uh, worked tirelessly to write and lobby for. I met with every single lawmaker, um, Republican and Democrat, um, in Lansing and explained just the impact of what was happening. And um, uh, I think Chris, uh, uh, last year's finalist, said, you know, I think ultimately everybody wants what's best for kids. And I just held on to that as right. the fundamental truth. Um, and at the end, it was pretty funny. The public schools said, like, we just didn't think this particular neighborhood had anybody insane enough to just like continue to run through walls for them. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, I hope they put that on my headstone. But you're permissionless in your efforts and, and, and it paid off and I just really admire that approach. Um, what do you all do to reach your young men, your young male students? What are you guys specifically doing? Oh my gosh, um, so much. I think waking up every day and remembering what I know to be true in my bones, which is that so much of society, and specifically the traditional school system, is designed to harm and not set male students of color up for success. And right. just knowing that in my bones, right? And then what sort of things can we put in place to immunize against that? Things we do have in place are a huge proportionate um, number of leaders of color because my belief is that folks who have commonalities with the students they're serving can best inform policies and protocols and things that are designed for our students. Um, having student developed, family developed norms and rules and protocols and systems um, to just like, again, continue to immunize against the like ever present uh, cancer that is bias. So I, I read with uh, one of you guys' um, posts that in, by 2024, most public schools will be filled with mostly children that are black and brown. How do we shift, how do we train parents, how do we shift this uh, uh, notion that you have to be a part of the public school to be successful? How do we encourage parents and even male 
role models that it's okay to step outside of that traditional system. Is that a mindset that just kind of has been embedded with it? What do we do to kind of fix that? Do you guys have any tips or suggestions? We only have a few minutes left. I just think that families have been generationally underserved as students over and over and over again. And so for us to start to change the mindsets about school and whether school is serving our students, whether school is serving our families, it takes full wraparound services. Yes. We know that it's not just uh, a um, inspired student, it's not just a great teacher, it's not just a great school. You need all three of these things and much, much more to really help a student succeed. And so we're really thinking about ways that we can bring in whole families mm -hmm. to be able to get get the empowerment that they need or empower themselves right. to be to make change. Yeah, and I was going to add to that. We also have to make it cool for men, uh, like the work my brothers are doing here, yes. to know that education is a cool profession. Exactly. And you have to know you can be yourself in, in your own skin in those spaces as well. So through the music, through the culture, right. through the art, you have to intertwine it all to create the entire young man. And so that's what we have the, uh, the, the capability of doing at our school as well. I love that. I think that um, you have to be able to connect to every student first, and you have to be able to connect to black students first, to boys first, whatever their, whatever their demographic looks like, you have to connect before you can educate. So Hans, what do you have to yeah, add I mean, in closing? We, we live in a 98% African American town, right? And, and um, the adjoining town, I go, you have to spend face time with those kids. That's what I've done through my 30 plus years career. You've gotta be in front of them. Right. I go to the Glendora, which has an 86% persistent poverty rate, right? And you go there, you talk with those boys, let them know college may not be your avenue, That's but right. what do you want to do? You have to have those kinds of conversations. If you talk to them respectfully, if you let them know, look, I'm no better than you, right. and we're not gonna use the term scholar, we're gonna right. honor your heart and your hands and the work that maybe your father did in the fields or as a long distance mm -hmm. truck driver, we can have those conversations. And they respect that, and plus it doesn't hurt that I can still do 15 pull-ups at a time, right? <laughs> right, so, <laughs> I yeah. love it. So in closing, I would just like to say that I am so grateful to uh, the Yazas and to Jeannie for you guys recognizing that there is a, a very major concern with our males in uh, America. And thank you for recognizing so many leaders um, this year so we can help kind of bridge this gap and this barrier that we have among our young men. So thank you all so much. And thank you guys. Good job.